Hello, everybody. So I hope that you're uh, here with the expectation that you're uh, gathering for um, a session uh, C. And um, uh, this is the um, session for professional development of educators. So can I just check that's your expectation? All right, very good. See if you're not there. That's fantastic. I know at least the, the first presenter is still... Uh, uh, has told me that she's still firing up her presentation. So, you know, I'm here, Michael. Way to go. So, Michael, I'm here. Oh, good day, Susan. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> that, was, that was quick. I just had to um, load up the actual presentation and go from there. So. Yeah, well, knowing the flurry of technology and, and how, uh, you know, you've got to be several hands all doing everything at all at once. I'm impressed how, how quickly you got that up and running. So good on you. Clearly you're a technical person. Uh, no, I no, just got lucky, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the right button of secrets. All right. Well, look, it is time to start. So we will do, do that then. Uh, welcome, everybody. We've got certainly 24 people at the moment. I guess that will increase as the cup of teas are drained and all that sort of stuff. Thank you for coming and certainly thank you for our presenters. Um, and we're going to have four sessions today, uh, this afternoon. Dr. Miriam Hamm and her colleagues will be talking about Talking in Circles, which is you, Susan. Um, with Miriam, yes. That's right. And then how to get information to sink in, which is from Trixie. Thank you, Trixie. And the Power and Compassion of Academic Developer from uh, Angela Dado from uh, Deakin. Welcome, Angela, and your colleagues. And are you sitting comfortable with a little bit of critical, uh, oh, sorry, creative um, input, uh, which I think at this time of the day is going to be very, very welcome. So welcome, Nadia. All right, so Susan, you're representing Miriam, Craig and Jackie, and uh, I ask you now to share your screen and uh, begin your 15 minutes. I'll give you a 10 minutes warning and then ask you at 15 minutes to close. Okay, so Michael, you can hear and uh, hear me and see our screen. Thank you very much. All of much. that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our presentation, to my mine and Mim's presentation today. Talking in Circles is a professional development initiative proposed by four School of Education lecturers and it is a project that we will trial in University Teaching Term 1 2020. We would firstly like to acknowledge that Talking in Circles is based on and adapted from work undertaken by lecturers at the Victoria University in Wellington and we thank those lecturers for sharing their work with us and for allowing us to tinker with their ideas in our lecturing spaces. So Mim and my presentation today about talking in circles will firstly present the context and purpose for the talking in circles initiative, we'll describe our six step process for talking in circles, we'll present three key documented prompts that facilitate lecturer engagement in the talking in circles process and we will identify our anticipated project outcomes. Enter. No, uh, I'm just having a bit of a conniption here with my uh, ne next, let me see. Yes, there we go, thank you. So what is this project talking in circles? Well, quite simply, it's a structured but informal, voluntary, reciprocal peer observation as le of lecturers as they teach in situ. In our project, the volunteering lecturers will watch each other teach in their respective online distance Zoom room sessions. So each lecturer, each lecturer will watch the other three lecturers once in action in their Zoom rooms. It is equally applicable to face-to-face -face teaching, but for our purposes, we're interested in the explicit teaching pedagogies used in the Zoom distance space. So, Talking in circles is a simple process that facilitates observation, reflection, conversation and action towards making positive changes in our own teaching practices. And we'd like to make that very clear. Talking in circles is not a peer review process. It is not about watching a colleague teach evaluating the practice and then giving that lecturer feedback. That's a more traditional coaching model that we're trying to move away from. So if you take a look at the dialogue catches on the screen, they sum up our process in a very simple way. So Craig, lecturer A, says, let's watch each other in our online distance Zoom room sessions. 
Jackie says, what did I see you do in your teaching that I could use in my teaching? What could I learn from watching you? I say, let's meet for lunch so that we can talk about our teaching. I would like to find out more about what I saw. And Mim says, in my next Zoom session, I'm going to try out one of the strategies that I saw you use. Miriam will now explain why there is a need for t talking in circles. Yeah, so as we know and as we actually heard in the last session, um, teaching and learning is our core business at university. So the scholarship of teaching and learning and actually making improvements in that space. Research suggests that teachers generally premise their pedagogical approach on the teaching methods they experienced as a child in the classroom. We actually call it teacher ghost. It's, it's a well-known fact for teachers. And why? It's because we subconsciously think that that is good teaching, whether we cognitively think that or not. And it's because um, it worked for us and so it becomes our default. When we run out of things to do, we default back to the way that we observed it being done with us. So what happens though when that tacit knowledge does, is not regarded as good teaching for a new generation of students or when there's the disruptive technological element where we've got to present in a completely digital space and it doesn't fit with what we've seen enacted before. So usually we respond by um, attending a professional development or we read a journal, we watch a video, or perhaps we don't change at all because we just don't know what to do. So professionalising university teaching through an engagement with scholarship of learning and teaching is critical to improving the learning experiences. That's why we want to change, to make it better for our students. Teaching demands that we change, particularly as our um, students change and as the technology changes, which is why we're focusing on the digital space with our project. Often as lecturers, we find ourselves, though, in a space of thinking that we're in a pedagogical solitude. So we are lonely in, this, in our space because it's us and the student without anybody looking in. And so we usually draw on teaching methods that are tried and true or what, that we've used before or that we have found to be effective in our space, but we rarely take time to examine the specifics of our own practice or even the practices of our other colleagues. So we might have um, an informal ad hoc conversation on the run in the tea room or, you know, as we're on our way around the photocopier, but do we actually invite colleagues into our teaching space um, for the specific purpose of collaborative, reflective review and teaching practice. I know that I don't, even though I teach teachers, which is another whole kettle of fish. We probably don't because at some point we've experienced some anxiety because we have been reviewed and possibly been the result, uh, um, had a negative review about our teaching. Um, or maybe we just have never um, had that opportunity and so it's a scary space for us. So researchers Cook, Slaver and Felton suggest that most, um, the most useful conduit for scholarly engagement emphasises active teaching um, focused on observations of others' practice, um, others practice with purposeful mentoring after we've observed their practice. So there is a need, therefore, to approach peer mentoring and professionalising of teachers' practice in a structured, organised way with clear expectations about the purpose, but most importantly, that that process is couched in um, a really safe, trusted learning environment. And that's where we got to with the teaching learning circles because that's the main aim, as Susan has already explained to you in that cycle. Teaching learning circles or teaching circles have been used um, in environmental settings for, for years. In fact, I used them back when I was teaching in schools. Um, e in each teaching circle, um, each participant is equal and each participant belongs. Our teaching circles project presumes uh, a focus on a collaborative, safe, positive approach in which we're engaging for the purpose of self-reflection, um, non-judgmental colleague uh, collegial observation and informal but purposeful conversations about our practice. We talk in circles, the circle being the symbol of trust and the professional learning community we're engaging in. 
Thanks, Mem. So our proposed six step talking in circles process is presented on this slide. And I'll just give you a moment to digest it. So the process starts here, oh, sorry, starts where the heart was, just here, where we actually initiate and form a talking circle. And it's done informally and it's done through invitation. So the four of us have banded together and said we'd actual, actually like to do this, to engage in this process. And so then the next step coming here is this pre-observation meeting. And that's when the four of us will come together and we'll talk about when we'd like to meet, the date, the time, what we might see in the actual Zoom room session. But before actually engaging in that part of the conversation, we also need to reflect on our own teaching. And we do use a pre-observation guide, and Nim will talk about that in the next slide. But the pre-observation guide is a very informal self-evaluation. What is it that I do in my own teaching? What do I do well? What areas would I like to strengthen? What is it that I think I might see in my other three colleagues' teaching that might resonate with me? And so at this pre-observation meeting, we're just generally talking informally between ourselves about our practice and what it is that we hope to be able to see in another's um, teaching uh, practice. So then we come from the pre-observation meeting down here into actually observing each other's teaching. And you can see on the slide that we do again have an observing teacher practice guide, which is a prompt. We're not calling them templates. Mim will um, explain. But the idea is that I will watch Mim, Jackie and Craig teach in their respect, respective Zoom room sessions. And essentially what I'm noting is what do I see in their practice? What do I see them doing? What do I hear them doing? What do I hear them saying? What do I hear about the interactions between teacher, student, student, student? And so I'm just documenting those observations without judgment. That's that, uh, 10 minutes, five to go, Susan. Okay, that's, that's key. And then we move, once our observations are noted, then we actually reflect on what we saw and identify things that we liked that we're curious about. And we take those things with us to a post-observation meeting where we talk about what we saw, what we liked, why people did it, and then we move to the next stage, which is enhancing our own or my own individual teaching by taking bits that I saw and putting them into practice. So that's our, our cycle. And Mim is going to explain further about these prompts. Mim? Sorry, forgot to unmute there for a second. Um, yeah, so as Susan has already shown, um, there is, whilst the, the whole cycle is quite fluid, there are specific junctures where we have more uh, comprehensive prompts and where you can actually do some journaling. We would recommend that we are going to be doing some journaling and writing answers to some of these questions. Not all of them. We'll pick and choose depending on particularly our pre um, pre-observation guide what we are focusing on so we will individualize it and the excellent thing about this is as you can see there with the questions what would I like to learn it is about what you as an individual so Craig might come in with some completely different objectives than what I would come in which is completely different to Susan so we are all in this to get what we need out of it um, and, and it's individualized the only other thing I want to draw your attention to is the middle section there, as Susan said, is that it's very objective, it's non-judgmental, it is what do I see, what are the students doing, what do I hear, and what do I hear them saying. So we try to make it as, as clinical almost as possible so that there's no judgment involved. And again, it's about feeding into what you hoped to get out of that, um, that session. Okay. 
And then obviously the last one is the um, the reflective guide. And again, this is flexible depending on what you were hoping to get out of it in the first place. So what are we hoping to learn? And when we enact this project next year, we're hoping it provides us with a platform of research in ways that we can engage in improving our practices that are both informal, but following a specific process and are most importantly supportive. We hope to be able to use it within our own school, but then we would love to take it beyond so that we are in cross-discipline schools um, so that we can share in spaces that we're not normally familiar with. We are aiming to have um, a culture that is collaborative, that is um, full of discussion and full of positive interactions in that we can learn in non-judgmental non ways. We hope too that our experiences might encourage others in the School of Education and across CQU to adopt similar processes and similar approaches as we go into the CQU renew of the practice that we do as well. Thank you. And I'd just like to finish up very quickly, Michael. And what we're also hoping to do as I go back to this slide is once the steps of the circle have been enacted and we're back here, we're hoping that we can participate with other colleagues in the School of Education to create other talking circles. And so with that ripple effect, so the momentum grows. And it is about non-judgmental observations we take out what we like and we try that in our own practice. I'll invite uh, Trixie James is going to talk to us a little bit about how do I get information to uh, sink in. So thank you, Trixie. Well, thank you. And thank you, ladies, for sharing there. That was uh, very, very interesting. And I love that, that whole approach about you know, being able to look at other people's teaching practices and, and looking at how you can apply some of those things that you feel would really benefit your own teaching. So I thought that was really good. It's a good segue a little bit into what I'm about to share with you now. This is a bit of research that I've done, a bit of scholarship into my own learning and teaching practices. And I've been able to share it with my school. Um, so this is lovely to be able to now take it further and share with you people. So I wanted that title as a bit of a catchy title because um, we, we all deal with adult learners and um, we're often and I often hear this from people saying you know oh, I don't know if this information is sinking in and so um, hence why I'm going to follow this path so basically let me just try and get this to work properly um, I have 15 minutes to quickly share around a framework that I have developed um, and it's and what you'll hear me talk about very briefly on a flip model classroom It's not about a flip model classroom, but that was what basically started this off um, Just very briefly talk about some of the theoretical principles that underpin this framework um, the, the what I developed this RCEA model um, that underpins this higher expectation framework so uh, I'm involved in the STEPS program, which many of you will know about. There are some of you that I know are from different universities here. So STEPS is an enabling program. Um, we, we help to develop students, get them ready to transition into university. Um, so, you know, us people within the STEPS program think we've probably got the best job in the whole wide world. Um, and some of my colleagues will probably be waving saying, yes, we agree. So. One of the units I teach in two is this preparation skills. So it's a core unit that all our students need to do. And it basically teaches them those basic skills about um, being a student. You know, time management, how to think critically, ranges like that. So with, on the Bundaberg campus where I teach, I can sometimes have 60 to 90, if not more students just in my class. Um, so I was looking at a way of being able to teach more effectively. Uh, and I'd heard about this flipped classroom model approach. So I thought, let's give it a try. So I did. And um, I, whilst I was doing that, I thought I'd evaluate it. So do a bit of research around it. Now, look, what I found with this research was that in this, using this type of approach, and if you know about it, great. If you don't, my apologies, but you, know, you can look into it a little bit more. Basically, it's, it's about students taking more control of their own learning. Um, so what I found the way that I implemented it, it was a very dynamic classroom environment, which is what, when you're internally teaching, it's what you're after. Um, very much active learning. There wasn't a lot of passive listening within this approach. A lot of group discussions and um, peer teaching was happening. And 
I could really see that they were constructing knowledge through these interactive approaches. Uh, so the benefits were really, really great. But then I noticed that there were some inadequacies. Um, first of all, a lot of the flipped, master, flipped model um, basic, oh, tends to apply more to secondary schooling, tertiary schooling, and even early education. Um, uh, so it sort of missed for me some of the what we need for adult education. Uh, also, there's an expectation that they do a lot of the work prior to coming to class. And what I also found was that really at only about 50% were actually doing reading before coming to class. They weren't doing the work. So they weren't coming in prepared. Um, and I've noticed even since then, that's the same. I'm still finding it's around about that number that are doing the work prior to coming class and sometimes it's even less. With the way I was doing it really needed a big classroom space somewhere where you could have a lot of small clustered seatings and a lot of our CQU campuses we don't have that luckily Bundaberg does but um, a lot of us a lot of the different campuses don't um, and, and the way I implemented it needed really good volume and you had to be very very organized um, in the way that you structured your lesson plans. So I stood back and I thought, they talk about scholarship, learning and teaching. I want to do a little bit more and I want to really delve into um, my teaching practice. So I, I looked at the key principles that I really believed underpinned how I taught. And I looked at um, adult learning principles because they really, like I, I believe they apply with my students, um, as well as brain-based learning principles, another set that I really value. And, and I was also thinking about that scaffolding, constructivist approach as well. So that were the sort of the key principles that, that underpin how I teach. So I looked at that. I looked at the part, the research that I'd done with the flip model classroom. And I started to think about how this could be developed into something more. Um, and that's where I actually came up with this framework. So it's, I call it the higher expectation framework. Um, mainly because we're in a higher, ex a higher um, educational environment and we sort of expect as they come in, they're going to be more autonomous. Um, so we have a higher expectation of our students. So hence, that's why I gave it that name. But as I started developing this, um, I really found that you could look at this one approach that I'm going to share with you now and you could apply it in a number of different ways. So it could be done through just your initial thought process when you're trying to, to plan, initiate what you're going to do. Um, it could be if you're planning to teach a particular concept and you really want that to, to sink in. Um, I even developed it right through to the classroom. So let me explain what this is. This is the RCEA approach. So what I found was that there was these four steps, basically, or four clusters of how students learn. And, and I found that these worked beautifully side by side. And even though you sort of flip backwards and forwards a little bit as they're learning, this, it really works as a process uh, or instructional sort of design that you could use for as an educator. And what I've also done, and I'll keep sharing around this, but I've also flipped this and made it into a reflective journal for students. So students can actually use this same approach, reflect on what they're learning. Um, and that's actually worked extremely well too. So I'm sort of going to share it more along um, how you could say teach a concept and then we'll very quickly look at how it could turn into a reflective journal for students. So basically the R is around reviewing. So it's around reviewing and establishing these basic concepts. So as I said before, not men, not not all students will come in completely prepared, but we need them to be. We need them to have some understanding of the concept so that we can then scaffold that knowledge. So the R is around making sure that you're um, giving them the basic information so that there's a platform there ready for them to be able to scaffold the remainder of what you want to be teaching them. So we have to start with reviewing, reviewing the concept, sharing it a little bit more detail, helping them to understand just the basics of that concept. So that's the R. Then we go to the, the C. Now, this is actually quite uh, an important part of learning for adults. And it's around the connecting. It's needing, they need to connect what they're learning to something in their lives. And it could be the past educational experiences. It could be working experiences. It could be family. It could just be something 
sort of connection, but they need to make that connection. It's actually how the brain will actually better um, cement the knowledge that you're trying to teach them. So you need to help them to make this connection to their own personal lives. From there, we step it out and we extend their knowledge. Now, this can be done in a, a range of different ways. You know, it could be getting them to search further and find more information around. It could be peer collaboration, getting them to talk with others. So as they're sharing their understanding about it, that, that, that connection starts to happen. Um, it could even be getting them to go on and look at more YouTube, just anything that's going to extend their knowledge about this particular concept. So within a classroom environment, we tend to do it more with interactive um, activities so they're talking to other students and then they're searching for something and just finding more information so that's the extend phase and then after that and I actually think this is probably one of the most important steps for students to cement understanding and that's applying what they've learnt right so they're thinking about what they've learnt and they start to think well how can I actually apply that into my own life um, and there's different ways of doing it it could be visioning seeing something for the educators if you're teaching students how to teach maybe sometimes it's envisioning themselves doing that teaching concept with their students so nurses being able to envision how what is it is you're trying to teach them and then doing that um, it could be applying it just to life in general some concept might be something they could apply to their life at that point even applying it into an assessment task so authentic assessment would also help to give to cement that knowledge so that's the RCEA approach I'm just checking time Michael I think about five minutes you have five the ten gone five to go Right, oh, thanks. So look, very quickly, I'll just show you just a very, very brief example. I just chose a very simple um, uh, learning styles that we teach within the unit. And I thought, so for the R, basically what I would be doing with this is I'm in introducing Solomon and Felder's learning styles. So I'll introduce, I'll give them some background, some history, and just help them to really understand the basic crux of, of what it is. Um, then once they've done that, they've got the basic understanding, then we'll go through and we'll do a, for this particular one, we actually go through and do a quiz because I want them to work out what their own personal learning styles are. So at this point, they're starting to connect and, sh and have a look at this, um, their learning styles and who they are. So how can they see that they're already using these styles, you know, past work experiences, past life experiences. And then we start to extend that knowledge through group activities where they actually work through a range of activities that um, sort of stimulate their senses and they actually have to come up with scenarios and different ideas on how they could better, you know, use these um, learning styles that they have within classroom environments. And then after that, we look at how they can apply that. So how can they apply that in a classroom? So if they know their learning styles, they walk into a classroom that doesn't really facilitate it very well, what can they be doing that's going to help them to better enjoy that classroom environment? So that's the four step approach, just showing you what it's like with a particular concept. So I use this with just individual concepts, um, lesson plannings. So I had an educator pick it up and create her um, cold class plans around using the RCEA approach. So what I want to show you too is that once we we're doing this, we started to realize that there's potential that this could work as a student reflective journal. So that was our next step is to create this journal. We had this idea and we thought, well, let's just give this a go. And so we've actually applied this, done a bit of research on it, and we're still sort of doing that at the moment. So what we've, what we've done here is we actually got students to uh, reflect at the end of each week using this RCEA approach. Um, so at the end of the week, they would just go back to their journal and then first of all, they would then review what they learned. So they would just jot down um, what the concept was about, or what the concepts were about with that within that week. What do they recall? Then they would write down um, the connections that they might have identified from past experiences or you know, what they've done prior to coming into steps. So just trying to make that connection. Then they wrote down sort of what additional information have you found out? You know, so they've extended their knowledge. Have they found out more? Some people went into like searched a little bit more, found out a little bit more information. Um, others would talk to other people and come up with a little bit more knowledge around that concept. And then finally, they were applying it. So they were actually then writing down how they could apply what they're learning into their own lives. So that was um, quite, it has been quite an interesting uh, 
challenge to to um, evaluate that and get back all the information and um, start writing that up but it has been good if you want to know more because I'm pretty sure my time is just about up but I did create a website where I've actually been putting all my resources so anything that relates to this around the the high expectation framework that RCEA approach the booklet the reflective booklet it's all can be found on the website and I'm just constantly just keeping adding to it and I want to develop this further and further when time permits of course so that's basically it for me thank you very much Trixie that's a, a wonderful addition as have the previous speakers have been and uh, I know for one I would like to access that as a resource so uh, you can expect some further questions from me in, in the next couple of weeks I think that's very intriguing I'll get you to unshare yes, your no screen worries. if you would and um, thank you very much and now I'm just wondering if uh, Angela Dado or her colleagues Alison George or Duncan are online at all yes Yes, uh, we are here. Yeah. Oh, that's you, Angela, is it? It's Alison. Uh, Hello, Alison. That's, that's Alison, and I'll quickly share our PowerPoint. You're very kind. Thank you very much. And uh, you're from Deakin. I appreciate very much your presence here. I know. Welcome, everyone, to our presentation. It's been really interesting um, so far. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to talk about our reflections on our research with academics who are enrolled in a graduate certificate in higher education. Um, and this was a mandatory requirement in our, um, in our um, universities. And so that's a particular, um, I guess, lens through which we were looking at, um, at this research. And I'm assuming that some of you um, who are present or listening are either academic developers who are teaching in that sort of professional development space or your academics um, in, um, in your discipline, either teaching and research. Um, and I'm hoping that some of the things we talk about will have some resonance with you. I'm Angela Dado, as um, was mentioned, and I'm currently teaching at Deakin in social work, but I was working last year with my two colleagues who are here today to present with me, um, Alison um, Owens and um, Georgia Clarkson, who um, we taught together last year in this um, space. And I want to talk about the sense of identity. And, and again, I think this is something you've probably all experienced, that, that um, academics are in the last couple of decades, really experiencing some shifts, so many rapid shifts that it starts to impact on the sense of who they are as academics. Um, and we've looked at those in terms of traditional allegiances to our discipline, is now challenge to allegiances or to requirements in the teaching and learning space, which has um, really ramped up in, in an environment of, of much greater accountability um, and regulation. Um, we've also looked in terms of power relationships and how um, more generally accepted student-centred practices, which of course you know, have lots of merit, but they do challenge more traditional power relationships between student and educator. Um, they're different perhaps from what a lot of academics were actually, or the ways they were taught. Um, and we've looked at those power relationships in terms of student consumer expectations. Student, higher education is expensive. Um, it's, it's based on a consumer model. Um, and that challenges this sort of, um, it generates a whole lot of risk for the, for the students, but it also challenges our relationship as academics to students because of that consumer relationship and expectation. Classification, of course, and increased technology means we have a whole wide range of students with a whole range of needs that sort of elicit some sort of pedagogical challenges, even though it's a, a really good thing in, in an equity sense. It does sort of create difference in, in terms of some of the teaching needs. And of course, our neoliberal context, we are in a very regulated managerialist environment. And uh, the sense of academics' autonomy can be undermined in that environment where, and I guess that was highlighted in our research, where the requirement to undertake learning and teaching was was a mixed sort of blessing. Um, and and it you know, generates that, rather than it being a, a choice that the academics are making to developmentally, to evolve and, and um, develop, it's something that's imposed from, from above. So that, again, reinforces that shift in, um, in autonomy. 
And and I guess the, the the reality is that the context we're in is is performance based, and it's more and more focused on teaching and learning. So it um, you know based on the quality of teaching and learning, so it puts quite a lot of pressure on academics. I'm going to hand over to Alison, who's going to talk a bit about our research. Thanks, Alison. Thanks, Angela. Um, yeah. So. At Australian Catholic University, we have been delivering the Graduate Certificate in Higher Education to teaching scholars. All teaching focus staff have been required to complete the Graduate Certificate by the Vice-Chancellor's Vice um, priority to try and achieve a culture of excellence in teaching and learning through this professional development. Uh, that has been delivered by a number of us academic developers to um, staff, teaching staff across all sorts of faculties and um, different campuses. Uh, as good SOTL practitioners, we decided it was useful to um, explore whether the Graduate Certificate in Higher Education actually was contributing to a culture of excellence in teaching and learning by way of some evaluative research. So. We chose a mixed methods approach where we um, implemented a survey, uh, 140 academics, we got a 33% response. And we also did some in vivo thematic analysis of the final assignment in the final of the four units, which was a critical reflection on what they had learned from their graduate certificate experience and what they were implementing in the classrooms. Um, we researched around the concept of identity. Um, uh, academic identity is strongly related to teacher efficacy, so teacher confidence and competence, uh, but it's also a dynamic um, concept. It shifts over time and it, it is individualised and contextualised. So we're also going to be conducting individual interviews, but at this point we're just reporting here um, on some of the data we received through the surveys and uh, through the analysis of assignments. I'm going to hand over to Georgia to take us through some of that data, Georgia. Yep. Uh, yeah. Next. <laughs> We can hear you, George, yes. Yeah, good one, thank you. Uh, yeah, so look, I, my, my role in this presentation is just to talk through some of the, the key data in terms of what we found. Uh, we've basically sorted it into three categories, um, which we've called the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, you know, the, the good data uh, was um, that people were surprised by what they've learnt in the, higher, in the grad, graduate certificate in higher education. Uh, despite having extensive experience in uh, tertiary teaching. So uh, the first uh, participant stated that they, before they started, they had uh, 20 years of university experience um, and received several citations and awards and um, <clears throat> was not convinced they would benefit from the course. But after completing the program, which consisted of four semesters and 13 assessments, um, was conceded that they were wrong and that there was there was a big eye opener in terms of improving their teaching. Uh, another participant noted that um, they share, through sharing ideas through one of their their subtle projects, um, they had fortnightly meetings and that helped to improve practice through a kind of a a bit of a spontaneous community of practice kind of approach. In terms of uh, uh, the theme of, of compuls the compulsory nature of the program. Um, the, a substantive number of them, uh, of the participants, recognised that um, it, it was a requirement, it was mandatory, it was, you know, it was related to their probation and they were effectively forced to, to do the, the study. Um, and that was, so that, that meant that they didn't come into it with a particularly positive attitude. Um, and that were a bit reluctant to it. However, um, after seeing, you know, despite that initial reluctance, after seeing, having some experience in the program, uh, they saw the changes that it made and um, the value of it to their teaching. And I'm just mindful of time because we had a delayed start. Finally, um, the, 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 the category we've named the ugly, um, <coughs> some 
commented on the time pressures that they were put under. They were given a certain workload allowance, which didn't really reflect the actual requirements to complete the, the units successfully. Um, and, you know, that they, they asserted that if they were given more time, that would enable the students to prosper because they would do, it, do the program justice. Uh, yeah, and I think I'm back to, am I back to Angela now to conclude? Is that right? Um, and if yeah. so, Angela, four minutes to go. Oh, cool. Thank you. Did you want to give your um, anecdote, Alison? Yeah, or? I was just going to give a um, just going to give an example of some of the um, intensity of the pressure that some of the staff felt under during this um, forced uh, two-year part-time study course. So. We talked about it before. We, we have a box of tissues on our desk, and I'm sure many academics do, actually. Um, but, you know, there was one occasion where a teacher uh, turned up with a whole load of paperwork to one of our um, uh, course meetings, uh, to learning sessions, um, quoting the union and saying she'd be back with them if she failed anything because she was being forced against her will to undertake this, um, and then sort of, you know, collapsed into tears and I, I was quite um, startled by the, the depth of her feelings about this, but I, I looked up her qualifications and she actually has got a Bachelor of Education, a Master's of Education, a PhD in education, not in adult education, only in primary education. But I could really feel for this person's um, pain at, at having done this. Having said that, she's, as, as a consequence of doing the grad cert, she's been engaged in applying for a grant, which she got, and she's been engaged in applying for a teaching award, which she's got. So she's now a star graduate of the, of the course. But I'll hand back to you, Angela, to discuss. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Alison. So I guess we, some of the, I mean, the, that was just a snapshot of the data, but as academic developers teaching in the GCHE, we, we wanted to, to reflect on what does this mean? Um, do we need to attend, or we do need to do, attend to the range of emotions academics bring into the course, um, which can be quite challenging online um, because we're not always connecting other than their initiative at that level. Um, we need to be prepared for a pastoral role, which is not uncommon um, for academics these days because of the physical and emotional demands on the academics. We can be conflicted as, a, as the educators when we have to fail colleagues or raise issues of plagiarism. Um, and um, I think there was another point in there, um, just that, that often our colleagues have very high expectations of themselves. And I wonder if Angela, you might conclude if that's all right. Oh, sure. Um, Academics are becoming students. That's a challenge to their identity. So um, we, we question whether it might be valuable to be explicit about identity changes in this process. And are there other ways that other people may have experienced to support the negotiation of these identity changes and what might be conducive to, um, to being enabling around them? Thank you, everyone. Great. Listen, thank you very much. And it's a, it's a thrill for a Sikh university to have uh, outside expertise come and join us. So thank you very, very much. Good. I'm sure there will be some questions for you. So we're letting our questions go to the end of the session. One more okay. session to go. So please be prepared for that. And use the chat room um, if, you, if you need to ask some questions as well, and they'll be collated for ongoing uh, discussion. All right. Well, our last session for, uh, for this particular session is interesting as well. Uh, Nadia, you're going to be uh, taking us in a bit of a creative journey. Your topic is, are you sitting comfortably? Okay, well, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Nadia Mead, and I'm a lecturer in education at the Cairns campus. And I want to talk to you about stories today, um, specifically about fiction as a teaching tool. So the questions I want to ask you are, um, should we use fiction as a teaching tool for tertiary training? Um, or is there a point at which fictional stories are no longer considered worthy as learning tools? And the other question I want you to consider is humorous fiction considered academic enough? So this presentation asserts the validity of using humorous fictional stories as a learning tool for tertiary students and provides a comparison of texts to provoke thinking and reflection, uh, specifically from the teacher training realm. So why are stories important? 
Well, reading fiction has been shown to encourage the development of empathy. Consequently, fiction and storytelling are accepted and desired components of the primary and secondary curriculum. Fiction is also valued for many reasons beyond the functional skill of learning to read with children. Students are encouraged to read for pleasure, for example. And we all know we've all read stories that have elicited strong emotions, uh, despite knowing the events we're reading are entirely made up. And that's because we've connected in some way with the characters. And that connection can be a powerful teaching tool. But what about the tertiary curriculum? We certainly use anecdotes from our own industry experience to illustrate problems and solutions and also to demonstrate the application of theory to practice. However, these anecdotes tend to be factual. Conflict in literature can present situations in a way that is non-threatening with behavioral role models via characterization. And there is safety in the distance of a fictional scenario compared to a factual account of the real event. And this distance allows readers to experience dramatic events through characters. And a dash of humour also helps to diffuse tension. For example, I know that some of my education students are anxious about parental conflict when they go into schools for their placement. And reading some fictional scenarios could counteract that anxiety. A character's reaction to conflict can inform the reader, especially when the reader has never encountered that particular conflict before. Characters can suggest novel ways of dealing with difficulties that a reader may have never considered before. And these are just some of the reasons we value stories so much. So if we know how important stories are at a primary and a secondary level, why not use fiction at the tertiary level? The efficiency of scenario-based learning and reflective learning approaches in teacher education is evidence-based. And literature shows that scenario-based learning is more effective than reflective learning in terms of academic achievement. The literature also shows that scenario-based learning is a valued and valuable means of exploring professional issues. And in the case of this presentation, specifically covers what pre-service teachers will face in the future. We do use scenario-based learning in our training courses, but they tend to be brief and clinical, and they're not usually funny. Banas Dubar and Rodriguez reviewed 40 years of using humour in educational settings based on student evaluations of their teachers. The study acknowledges that different types of humour samples were generated, thereby preventing definitive answers. As you can imagine, over 40 years, lots of different kinds of humour um, examples were collected. And the differences tended to be dependent upon the individual lecturer um, and they tended to be ad hoc uses of humour rather than planned teaching strategies. So, for example, some used cartoons in their lecture notes, some used jokes, but they weren't strategically planned for conflict resolution. They were seen as enhancements to the content. Um, Generally, though, this review of 40 years of scholarship leans more towards validating the use of humour in teaching and learning, because what they did see was that there were results that showed that lectures that had humour in them um, showed that the students retained more of the knowledge. As humans, we can use humour to connect with others. We share funny stories, sometimes repeatedly, because of the pleasure we derive from laughing together. And laughing together helps to diffuse tension and anxiety. 
¿Por qué no los dos? So those, some of you might recognize that as Spanish for why not both. You might recognize it from a very famous taco ad. But I wanted to use it there because we've already considered the merits of fiction and the merits of humor. And I wanted to ask the question, why not both? Why not have them together? So I'd like to share a comparison of scenarios with you. And this is from the teacher training domain. First, I will ask you to imagine you are a pre-service teacher studying relationships, communication, and potential conflict. You're concerned about how to deal with hostile parents. Next, I'd like you to consider what you would learn from this scenario. This is Francesca's story. It is your first day of the school year and your students are excitedly waiting outside. One student, Francesca, appears to be untidy in appearance. And when you look more closely, you see that she has a bad cold and runny nose. Her father is talking to another parent and ignoring his daughter. Francesca's face is now very messy because of her runny nose and you approach her father for a tissue. He is annoyed that you have interrupted his conversation and tells you to deal with the issue as the student is now your responsibility. The father leaves. You help Francesca blow her nose. Now I'd like to tell you a different version of that story. And as you listen, still enroll as a pre-service teacher, consider what learning you take away from this version and which scenario you consider to be the most effective in teaching you how to develop strategies for dealing with conflict. So, are you sitting comfortably? Then I'll begin. Francesca. The little girl's hair was pulled tightly into two ponytails, one above her left ear and the other below her right, like a lopsided wig. Sarah could see blue eyes and freckles, but her stare was focused on the thick green caterpillar of snot that led from the child's left nostril straight onto her top lip. Francesca's tongue flicked up at intervals and poked at the caterpillar so that it jiggled and slid down over her lip and into her mouth. Before Sarah could comment, Francesca used her hand to wipe away the annoying rivulet of mucus smearing it across her left cheek and into her hairline. Sarah waved at Francesca's father, who was talking to another parent. Do you have a hanky? she asked. The man's nose wrinkled at Sarah and his eyes flashed. She's your problem now. You clean it. Sarah watched as Francesca's father turned and left his child without a word. She remembered the packet of wet wipes in her desk and rushed to get them. Poised with the first wipe and with Francesca's face upturned ready for cleaning, Sarah gently pinched the small damp square over Francesca's nose to collect the nucleus of green horror. Her intention was to pinch off the sauce and then use a fresh one to clean the spread up into the hairline. However, Francesca blew heartily into the wet material as she always did when a grown-up placed a tissue or cloth around her nose and sabotaged her teacher's efforts. To her horror, Sarah felt the warm flush of mucus vibrating down Francesca's nostrils out through the bottom of the wipe and into her hand. Sarah froze, unlike the snot that hung from her hand in one obscene and gelatinous lump. I need to blow more, said Francesca, grabbing Sarah's hand and placing it over her nose once more. Francesca blew hard again, and this time the globule that had been hanging from Sarah's hand flew onto the front of her dress. Thank you, said Francesca. So as a pre-service teacher, which scenario would make you feel more at ease? Which one would give you better strategies to deal with potential conflict? And now do you have four minutes to go, please. Thank you. As a lecturer, which of these scenarios do you think would produce the most discussion? What about the quality of the discussion? And how would that aspect differ from the serious to the humorous? 
I hope this comparison has prompted some thinking and reflection about the validity of using fictional scenarios in tertiary courses. And if you'd be keen to keep the discussion going with me, I would love to hear from you and I would love to hear any feedback about the scenarios I've shared with you. Thank you for listening. All right, well, thank you very much for that, uh, Nadia. And, uh, Thank you. That's a very engaging presentation, as they all were. So I'm going to open up for questions very shortly. Before I do that, <laughs> thank you because very it's much. important now that uh, all, all 28 of us uh, sort of wave our hands in the air just to thank our uh, four groups of presenters um, for their uh, uh, time, their very excellent uh, presentations, and they're certainly very thoughtful ways which they've uh, helped our uh, um, education about scholarship and learning uh, in this particular session. I know I've taken a few notes, and that's great. So uh, before I open for questions, don't forget tomorrow starts at 9 o'clock. Very interesting plenary at 9.30. And then, of course, the sessions uh, in their triumvirate uh, format begin again at 10.30. So that's great. All right. Well, we'll use a chat room if you need to. But otherwise, uh, has anybody got some questions for our present any of our presenting teams? Perhaps I'll start off uh, while you're all thinking about that. And uh, I, I was just wondering, uh, Nadia, um, is there anybody ever done some humour and uh, fiction for teaching engineering mathematics? I, I haven't ch checked that out. The, um, the scholarship that I looked at for um, over 40 years worth of research covered lots of subjects. I'd have to go back and see if it did cover anything to do with mathematics and engineering. Well, I'd be, I'd be interested in that. And uh, while people are putting their questions together, uh, Trixie, I wonder, could you talk very briefly to the idea that the flipped classroom is really doing the tutorials first? Mm, yes. Yeah, so when I really looked into it, yes, that's the, the underlying feature is that you give the students um, tasks to do from home. So it might be online tasks. They do that and then when they come to the classroom, then it's about um, extension activities and develop them, developing them further from that. Um, so like the, the idea behind it is amazing. And when you think about it, it would be great if that would happen. But what I'm finding is that it doesn't happen. Like the students don't do a lot of that work prior to coming to class. And uh, unfortunately, but that seems to be it. And I don't think it's just steps that it's known for. I hear it right throughout the undergraduate arena where our students just do not come prepared. And that's one of the negatives. Now, this was developed for secondary um, classrooms. That's where it, the, the key thing was developed. Um, and, and as I sort of did research into it, I, I really had mixed findings. Some people loved it, some people didn't. Um, there wasn't an actual framework. That's what really stood out to me because I, I thought, how do I teach it? How do I actually implement this into my classroom? And I couldn't actually find anything that gave me the, you know, step-by-step -step approach of what to do. So that was a gap and I thought I need to create a framework that can do this. But then, then I started realising that um, I really needed to look at it from an adult um, environment. So that's where I created mine from. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. there's positives like everything in teaching and learning. There's positives and negatives that will work for some people, won't work for others. Um, I want to develop this further now into my online course. And right. Thanks very much, Trixie. Thanks. That's, that's very, very intriguing. So I wonder if anybody's got some questions, particularly for Angela and her team uh, with uh, our own experience of the Graduate Certificate of Higher Education. So very very grateful for some of the scholarship that you've done around that and uh, some of those I think patterns can be seen but is there any questions uh, for Angela and her team at all? Angela I wonder if perhaps you might just very uh, briefly uh, comment on um, whether you think that um, there is uh, evidence of the improvement of people's teaching as a result of the GCHG. Sure. Mm. Yeah, it was hard to convey the extent of um, that first um, theme, being surprised by how much people learned. It was actually um, almost universal, their response about how much they gained, even though there was a high cost emotionally, even though there were challenges um, contextually, um, the, it was almost universal that that they gained lots. I guess one thing that came through was that they could have gained a lot even more um, because of the, I guess, the depth and the richness of the actual um, materials, but if they had more time, you know, to, so they were doing it on the hop. But generally it was, it was really great. But, um, but 
But I th thank you, Michael. But I, I'm just sort of wondering if I could ask Nadia a quick question. I'm absolutely curious about about this um, um, the idea of humour and fiction as a, an educative tool in higher ed, and I'm really open to that idea. What intrigued me, Nadia, was with those two scenarios. I my question is, I wonder if the second one, while much more graphic and um, and humorous, um, would be a distraction to the actual issue around how to navigate a parent. I mean, it's, it's just a question. And I guess I, I wonder too, in both scenarios, at what point do, are questions inserted or where, what kind of questions might be constructed and where and, or at what point? And I, I wonder if the questions will be different for the two different scenarios. So there's a few questions in there, but but I was absolutely intrigued. And yeah, I just sort of, I was thinking as a potential student that um, that I might find that whole rather um, queasy <laughs> illustration <laughs> quite distracting. <laughs> Um, and that distraction is actually uh, quite helpful when you're dealing with conflict because some mm. of these pre-service teachers are really very, very scared um, mm. about dealing with parents and sometimes more so about the parents than dealing with the students themselves. Mm. And so putting in that really quite grotesque humour um, forces you to squirm laugh be sick whichever um and so it distracts you from the conflict with the parent because in that scenario what you're dealing with is a parent who is not remotely interested um mm. and for primary school teachers um it's a very real event you know you are going to be dealing with snot and far worse so um it's <laughs> i'm not a primary teacher <laughs> it's, it's going it's going to be a lot worse than that in some cases and so by shocking them into that, you know, ideally the idea is that when the conflict comes, there'll be some sort of trigger that thinks, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, we looked at this, we had a laugh about this before, and mm -hmm. it's not going to be so confronting. It's interesting that the learning seems to be more around um, negotiating the uncomfortable realities. The, the parent, in some way, was a fairly small issue. It was just totally disengaged with his child but and with the teacher but um but i guess the the issue was the sort of the confronting um visceral and and mm. physical reality so so i guess there are a number of layers you can explore that which which could be for some students not as traumatic as, as um or intimidating as a parent but just to quickly respond to that so a lot of our students um are really shocked when they hear about parents who are disinterested because okay for, for some of them, you know, they're coming, they're coming to university, they're coming from supportive environments. And so, and they want to be teachers. So they mm. care about kids. And so when mm. they encounter incidents where uh, parents aren't interested, it's quite tricky for them to get their heads around that. Okay, I'm a social worker. So, so I'm used to it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, we haven't quite finished with questions yet. I want to take Michael Tong's uh, perspective up and just ask uh, Miriam and Susan, um, what happens when uh, colleagues aren't as collegial as you would like? Can you still do these circles? Uh, I'll jump in, Mim. Um, because we haven't trialled it yet and it's um, a notion um, as a proposal, we're not sure. But I think my response is I understand workplaces are different and, and there are different relational dynamics. But because and so I guess you know before and I said about the ripple effect we would be hoping that from what um, that people our colleagues might see that we engaged in this process and it was actually non-judgmental it was a bit of fun we had lunch together we chatted we got something out of it that it that people could come into the space um, whether we've got um, because it's non-judgmental and non-judgmental and non-critical, I think it would still work. But I understand that people, Michael, that people would be more reluctant to come into the space because their experiences with similar processes that have been evaluative may not have been so productive, so positive. And I guess it's about us trying to re-educate our colleagues that this is what we're trying to do this is the purpose of it come and try it 
Right. And it's yeah. like you take the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. <laughs> yeah. Can I also add to that? You um, There is a process at the start where you agree to the rules. So mm -hmm. if you've made it really clear and made it a decision that you will not criticise, then you, the others are well within their rights to go, just a minute, that sounds like an evaluation. That's not what we are agreed to. So there is other mechanisms you can weave into the process to keep that going. Yeah, great. All right, listen, thank you very much for your responses. People will be leaving now. It's time really to start finishing up. But if there's anybody with some last questions uh, out there. Can, can I uh, jump in there, Michael, please? Thank you, Michael. Uh, um, one of the things I didn't mention also in my uh, comment in the chat uh, uh, option is um, I, I think the culture of the university plays a very important role in something like this. Uh, I've worked at quite a few universities and some universities just don't have that supportive collegiate culture. And I think that would be difficult to implement it. But I think uh, a lot is uh, so dependent on say, top leadership, uh, top management support. Uh, if the senior uh, officials support something like this, I think it can go a very long way. So that's, that's one thing I want to say. Can I just uh, say that this third concurrent session today has been the personal highlight for me. Um, I, look, I, I, I was just really taken by Alison and her team's presentation uh, on, on the role of uh, teaching and learning and what sort of impositions it, it places on uh, staff, especially sessionals and all that. Mm -hmm. And the last presenter, Nadia, you really uh, hit the nail on the head for me because I have used something similar in, in the business uh, context. But I haven't used stories, I've used sort of uh, films or video clips, and I think it has a very similar sort of effect. So I just want to finish by saying that today for me, this last third concurrent session has been the highlight for day one. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that too, Michael. No worries. Thank you for your comments. And I guess if you could put those comments into the evaluation, that'd be much appreciated. Sure. So thank you for everybody. Can I just ask everybody to give their last hand waves and thank yous to our presenters because it has, as Michael said, it's been a most enlightening session. Um, look forward to seeing you tomorrow and thank you very much for your time. Nadia, I can see you're still there. Um, this is Sue. I'm just really curious how you develop the skills to write in that style. I missed the start of your comment because um, I'm, I keep faffing around with this and messing up. Sorry, so, and I was trying sorry. to find how to reply to your comment and Miriam was just trying to help me. So sorry. That's Please. okay. We, we can chat now. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm just really curious how you learnt to write in that style because it's not a style of writing that I think most people would be accustomed to. So did you do any particular training or do you learn that as part of being... A, a primary school teacher or no it's, it's a, or are you it's just a, gifted <laughs> no thank you uh no, i i write i write creatively for fun um okay. and my phd actually used creative writing as um the means for exploring teacher identity and experience because i found that it was just the best way to do that so um i am okay. you know a, a, a mad keen writer um, in a past life, I was a high school English teacher too. So, um, you know, all of that, I, I had yeah. to teach kids how to write creatively. Okay. So uh, that's yeah. where it's come from. Yeah. That, I, I really relate to that. I, I work um, academic developer, but with vet lecturers. Yes. So the scenario that you had on screen yes. about Francesca, Yes. Very, very typical of a scenario yes. that, that we would see all exactly. the time. Exactly. But the story that you read <laughs> was that was just something else again. Well, thank and you. Would, and would be so much better as an assessment activity because you'd then build your questions around that and um yeah. Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a really good takeaway. So thank you. Thank you very much thank for that feedback. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Really enjoyed your session. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.